Thank you very much, Luda, for inviting me here. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, because, uh, especially because uh, we were users of this facility for quite a few years, until probably last year, when we got our own uh, high-resolution electron microscope. And uh, the microscope that we got was not uh, Titan Cryos, but rather a new generation microscope from GEO. Cryo arm and the first microscope, or one of the first actually ever made microscopes, was installed in Brussels. And today I wanted to share with you our experience with this microscope and um, tell you a little bit about uh, what works well, what works less well, and how well it performs. Actually, it does work very well. <laughs> um, so the story started in uh, 2015 when we uh, applied for a grant for large infrastructure. Uh, this Hercules grant uh, existing in, in Flanders as a consortium between several groups from uh, Flanders Institute of Biotechnology, VIB, and uh, Free University of Brussels. So there are groups coming from uh, University of Leuven and University of Ghent. And we got the grant, which was complemented by internal funds. And <clears throat> at the beginning of 2017, we ordered the 300 kilovolt electron microscope. And as those people who ever set up cryo facility would know very well that microscope is only part of the story. So the other, probably more important part of the uh, successful cryo facility is actually the building. So we also found the building which was an old uh, uh, student accommodation, which in terms of geometry, fitted actually very well as a, as a uh, place for installing the microscope. And uh, within a year or so, we actually managed to convert this building into a facility where uh, our high-resolution microscope is installed in this cube, <coughs> and uh, other microscopes are installed in, in the other wing. So the facility... Uh, it's called BESM, that stands for VIB, the UB facility for bioelectron cryogenic microscopy. And it's open to all the users in Belgium and in Europe. So it includes a uh, sample preparation lab. We have two screening uh, 120 kilovolt uh, GEO 1400 microscopes. And of course, GEO cryo arm. So, Dual cryo arm, like uh, all the modern microscope, is a is a nice box which uh, contains a cold field emission gun. So it has a full lens condenser, cost cryogenic stage, can hold in time up to 12 grids. It has in column energy filter, and uh, since a couple of months we have also K3 detector from Gatan. It also has faceplate, which uh, we haven't actually explored uh, very much up to now. So inside this box there is an actual microscope, this uh, column and all the wires hanging <coughs> down. So when it comes to uh, manipulating the, the microscope, it has a, a quite nice uh, software. So you have an image uh, of the microscope, interactive image where you can change uh, many things just by clicking on different parts of the microscope. You can see if there is a sample on the stage or not. <clears throat> but what I find really nice is that it has also another window nearby where you have settings for all the lenses and all the deflectors and stigmators. And by simple click of a button, you can go to free lens control and do whatever you want with your microscope. Of course, that's not something you would do uh, regularly uh, during the data collection, but if you want to explore something or play with the microscope and see what is possible, you can actually easily do it, and I find it very convenient. So, uh, since it was the first microscope, we did take a lot of risk, and <clears throat> at that time, we didn't know, well, we had to trust Geo that this microscope will be suitable for regular automated data collection. And when we got the microscope, uh, we had to characterize it uh, 
different parameters of the microscope to see how suitable it actually is. And what is important uh, for automated data collection, as many of you would know, is that the microscope should have very stable beam, which is a question for cold fact, as I will say, uh, explain in, in a couple of <coughs> minutes. So we want to have a very stable stage, low rate of ice contamination, <coughs> and good software for efficient data acquisition. So I'll start first with a uh, cold fag. So the idea of cold fag is that the, uh, the crystal which is used uh, to emit electrons in cold fag is uh, kept at low temperature, which means that the energy spread of electrons is reduced. So the beam has higher uh, coherence. At the same time, because beam, uh, because the crystal is at lower temperature, it gets contaminated. So the intensity of the beam decreases with time. Uh, potentially, it has a lot of uh, impact on the high resolution data. So if you look at the envelope function, or part of the envelope function, which is due to the uh, energy spread of the electron, then this is how a uh, short key gun compares to the uh, cold fag. So you see that the advantages that cold fag provides, they start from below to uh, angstrom resolution. So if you want to go for really, really high uh, resolution, then uh, cold fag in principle should be your choice. However, if you look at the uh, intensity change from the microscope over time, you can see that it decays slowly over a few hours and then starts decaying faster. So to recover intensity, you need to flash the gun. That's a procedure involving turning off the emission and passing short current of uh, short electrical current through the gun to warm it up and desorb the absorbed molecules and then turn on the emission. It takes only a minute or two, so it's very fast. So we decided to do it every four hours or four and a half hours to keep the beam intensity uh, stable. So what we expected is to have uh, so like profile, and that's what we do, what we are getting. So uh, this measurement done over a couple of days, we can see that after each gun flash, beam intensity does recover, but in a sort of bit unpredictable way. So in the end, the fluctuations of the gun. Uh, intensity that we have, at least under our current settings in the microscope, is about 25% of the intensity, instead of 10% that we wished we had. But in the end, it's also not very important for the, uh, for the quality of data that we absorb, that we collect on the microscope. So that was a bit unexpected. Uh, then we also checked what happens with beam tilt during flashing, and we saw that, uh, again, the same recording over about two days' time, that beam remains very stable, at least within uh, 0.1 milli, milli radian, which is good enough for resolution uh, below to, to angstrom. So overall, um, conclusion here is that the, the beam intensity fluctuates higher than what you would like, it too, although dual engineers are working on it and we hope it will be improved, but overall beam quality is very stable. So another unexpected finding was that uh, because of the high coherence of the beam, we have fringes from the objective aperture that go very far. So if you zoom in, you can see that you have this wavy pattern going to the close to the center of the beam, such that, see, from 3,000 pixels along this axis, about 2,000 actually fringes. And uh, it means that the area of the beam usable for the single particle data collection constitutes about uh, 10 to 20% of the total beam only, which limits number of uh, images you can take per hole. So we did try to improve it, so that's how uh, fringes look like if you decrease aperture. And it's possible to retune condenser 
to get rid of the screen just completely, or nearly completely. But at the moment, we haven't really found a uh, solution uh, which is compatible with single particle, uh, with automated single particle data collection. So again, that's one of the points uh, engineers, geo engineers, aware of, and we hope that it can be improved in the future. Okay, so let's uh, talk about sample handling and uh, cryogenic stage now. <coughs> so the uh, samples are transferred, uh, grids transferred to the John cartridges in a, a transfer station, which is uh, reasonably simple to use and PhD students and postdocs get trained very quickly to, to be able to transfer their grids independently. And uh, grids are uh, clipped in a cartridges with a clip ring. So these cartridges are quite large. And grids goes here in the center. Um, with the advantage that uh, this both clip rings and cartridges are usable. So this microscope operates without any consumables, which is really uh, helpful. And uh, then the cartridges are transferred in the microscope in a special cup with a magazine shown here, where you can put up to four cartridges, but you can choose between one and four cartridges for single transfer. Once you transfer cartridges from the microscope, where you can uh, store up to 12 cartridges, and you can remove uh, between one and four cartridges at any time, uh, these cartridges are <coughs> appear on the, on the software, and the handling of the, of the grids is very, very simple. You just choose the grid you like, you press uh, load or withdraw to the magazine, and that's all you have to do. So the microscope would place it uh, where you ask it, would remove the grid, and uh, uh, each grid has a unique name and number, so you never get confused with the grids. So you find this uh, system of uh, sample handling developed by Joel and this microscope very, very user-friendly. Okay, so now, uh, when you insert this cartridge in the microscope, the question is how reproducible the position of the cartridge if you put it in the microscope and take it out. So we measured this and found that uh, in average, the, in spite of the fact that the cartridge is so large, the accuracy of the positioning in the stage is uh, about <coughs> two and a half micron. It's probably maximum shift we ever had is, is below five microns. So it means that if you use uh, grids for single particle data collection, you can select holes that you like uh, you, uh, your data to be collected from. You can put the grid back, screen other grids, and if you decide to collect data from this grid, you can put it uh, inside the column and start data collection. It will work. So, uh, the other uh, properties of the stage associated with standard operations like uh, uh, insertion of the grid or refilling of the uh, nitrogen duars is a drift. So we, what we wanted to know is how long time do we need to wait to equilibrate the microscope after duars are refilled or after we change the grid. So we measured this as well. What we see that <laughs> within 10 to 15 minutes, basically a microscope is ready for data collection. So the duars are filled uh, twice a day, about uh, every 12 hours, while uh, when we change the grid, we would usually, uh, during first minutes, collect an atlas of the grid. So in the end of the day, it doesn't uh, have any significant impact on, on the uh, data throughput or screening throughput. So that works quite well. So next, we collected the data set and looked at the stage drift during data collection. So during our data collection, we, uh, like during any single particle data collection, we go from hole to hole. We, uh, the microscope would be, the position of the stage would be 
adjusted with the accuracy of say 0 0.3 micron that takes under a minute and then we don't wait additional time so we just start data acquisition what you can see here is that again an average drift after shifting to a new hole is in the order of two angstrom per second that can be converted to uh, about 0.4 angstrom per frame if you record data on K2 detector. And uh, the impact of this drift would be very, very small for resolution uh, at least up to 2, micron, uh, two, two angstrom. So essentially, uh, stage is stable enough to allow for uh, high throughput, high resolution data collection. So there is no need for very long uh, waiting times. So the stage performs really good. Next question is what happens with ice contamination? How long can we keep our samples inside the microscope? So we measure this as well inside the outer loader and inside the column. So to measure it in the outer loader, we took a grid, we took an image, and when you have an energy filter, with energy filter you can take image with, grid, with a slit and without slit, and from difference in intensities you can measure easily the ice thickness. So we measured ice thickness for a particular region of the grid, we put grid back, waited for a few days, put it inside the column again and measured ice thickness, and what we saw is that ice contamination rate in the outer loader is below one angstrom per hour. That translates to, uh, uh, what is it, 20, uh, 2.5, uh, 2.4 nanometers per day. So it's, it's really small. You can keep, for most of the samples that don't require extremely thin ice, uh, you can keep grids in the, Auto loader for a few days or even a week without noticing significant uh, difference. To measure contamination inside of the column, uh, we collected a long data set over uh, 84 hours and then for each fifth or tenth uh, hole, we measured image of the hole without slit and with slit. So we could calculate the ice thickness for. Uh, selected uh, selected regions on the grid. And of course, the ice thickness by itself is, uh, is random because we don't really control ice thickness in each individual hole, but you can see the trend. So you can see that the ice thickness increases with time, and uh, from this linear plot we could derive that <coughs> the contamination rate is in the range of uh, 2.5 uh, angstrom per hour, or around 6 nanometers per day, which is uh, quite quite good. Also, again, if you have very thin ice, like in this case for apopheritin, you see the initial ice thickness was uh, around 20 nanometers, and it's increased over 4 days to 40 nanometers, so you do lose some signal, but in most cases the ice thickness would be much higher, so over standard uh, data collection time, which would be between, say, 24 and 48 hours, the contamination essentially would be negligible. So the, the microscope, in this, this respect, microscope performs uh, really, really well. So what about automated data collection? So for automated data collection, we, uh, we are using serial AM, uh, in which we like that it's a very uh, flexible uh, flexible software where we can design our own data collection procedure and uh, uh, introduce different steps uh, when necessary, like uh, eye sickness measurements or <clears throat> exposure to multiple positions with uh, uh, adjustment of the beam tilt to avoid uh, aberrations. So when we had K2 detector, we were able to collect up to 40 images per hour with exposure, with one exposure per hole. So after each exposure, we had to move the stage. And with four exposures per hole, 
about 100 images per hour. So now with K3 detector, this uh, rate of data collection increased to about 140 images per hour with uh, five explorers per hole. And uh, that will be further increased to probably two or 300 uh, images per hour, we hope. And the uh, advantage of serial AM also that we have extremely good support from uh, developer of, of the program, David Mastranad. So, conclusion is generally that microscope is perfectly suitable for single particle data collection. It's also uh, very stable, and uh, we can run data set after data set uh, over, over weeks without much uh, intervention. But uh, it's also sensitive to the external environment. So we know that our cooling temperature of the microscope fluctuates. This is because our cooling system is just not perfect. Just plus minus 0 0.1 uh, degree. And that has an influence on the energy filter. So for purposes of this demonstration, I uh, intentionally misaligned energy filter so that you can see the the slit from the energy filter. This is accelerated movie about 40 minutes uh, long that shows uh, how our periodic uh, changes in the water cooling water temperature influence the position of the slit in the energy filter. So the shift is just a couple of electron volts. So the normal data collection, you don't really see it. But behind the sun, we know that it's there and it's caused by just instability of external parameters. So in the end, the stability of the microscope doesn't depend on the microscope only, but also is defined by the uh, stability of the environment. So being inspired by uh, online image processing uh, in, 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 in NES, at Nessen, my postdoc, uh, Alexander uh, Shkumatov, he developed his own scripts that allow visualization of the pre-processed images as collection goes. And uh, we can also get uh, online statistics so that you can see if uh, the focus values are in the range where you expect them to be. What happens? So you can see what happens with eye sickness. And uh, if you wish, you can adjust uh, date collection parameters as your date collection goes, or stop if you see that eye sickness is too high. <laughs> okay, so now I would like to talk about a couple of benchmarks that we did. Uh, it took us some time to set up automated data collection on the microscope, just because uh, when the microscope was installed, the infrastructure was not perfect, and we didn't really know how to do automated data collection on the microscope for some time. But once it started working, first sample that we uh, collected data from was uh, GrowVL. So we did it at relatively low magnification with a pixel size of 1.2 angstrom per pixel, collected uh, nearly 4,000 images. Yeah. Of course, with energy filter from which we extracted 600,000 particles, which results in a reconstruction uh, at 2.8 angstrom resolution. So and it's, it is 2.8 angstrom resolution map. You can see very well resolved uh, backbone, uh, side chains. And uh, you can see also that, uh, as well known for grow yields, the resolution is not homogeneous, it's more. Uh, the structure is better defined than the core in the center than on the periphery where it's a bit flexible. So then we wanted to see uh, where the limits are, and uh, we tried to collect <coughs> high resolution data set with a uh, mouse heavy chain up ferritin, which is known as a standard for high resolution uh, single particle data sets. But first of all, I should say that we try to prepare really nice sample with densely packed uh, grow real uh, particles and failed miserably. 
So in the end, we collected data from samples that had only 20, 30 particles on average per image. Of course, we collected it at a bit higher magnification, in this case, 80,000 corresponding to pixel size of 0 0.6 angstrom per pixel. Again, we had to collect quite, quite a few micrographs to extract 100,000 particles. That was good enough to uh, get mapped at the resolution of 1.9 angstrom. So here you can see a Fourier shell correlation between uh, half data sets as well as between uh, model and the final reconstruction. On the density, you can see very well density for multiple water molecules. You can see individual atoms in aromatic residues in uh, uh, aliphatic chains of uh, hydrophobic amino acids and so on. So the resolution is, is, is there. <coughs> and we collected this data set without actually using anything different apart from magnification, using anything different for the data collection. So we collected it with four explorers per hole with a image shift of uh, about 0 0.55 micron per each, uh, for each exposure. And to reach this high resolution, it was important to correct the beam tilt for different uh, images we took, for different directions. So what we found out, well, first of all, in this particular case, our beam was a bit tilted, so it was about 0.4 uh, milliradian of the uh, non-tilted uh, position. So, but what we can see is that the fact that we shift the beam off center in different directions actually creates quite significant uh, significant uh, beam tilt. So in this case, it was corrected computationally and it was estimated as being around 0 0.36 milliradian per one micron, uh, which is about twice higher than what was reported for uh, Titan cryos microscopes. So that's something we, we are investigating just to see whether it was due to uh, misalignment of the microscope or its properties of the, of the uh, imaging system of the uh, in any way, uh, it doesn't prevent us from getting high enough uh, resolution <coughs> and obtain sub 2 angstrom reconstruction. Um, we also checked the stability of the beam till during the data collection from the same data set, which was subdivided into smaller chunks, and the, the beam tilt was uh, fitted and reliable for these chunks, and we can see that the beam tilt is essentially very, very stable. It's, mm -hmm. the, the fluctuations are within 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.05 milliradian, which, uh, which is quite, uh, quite small. So it's, it won't be noticeable at resolution uh, below probably 1.8, 1 uh, 1.6 angstrom. So we also calculated the, the B factor for this data set. And you know, the B factor is pretty, pretty standard. But what we can see that it appears like at the higher, uh, higher resolution, the, B, the, the dots from the B factor deviates from the straight line, uh, which can be uh, due to multiple reasons, one of which might be the fact that we uh, adjusted the position of the, of the of the beam using image shift, which created also small beam tilt, which we don't account for, which would be random. But what, what, what is remarkable here is that using 100 particles of apoferritin, which corresponds to 2.4 thousand uh, asymmetric units, is enough to obtain resolution of 3.7 angstrom. And with uh, 10,000 Asymmetric units corresponding to 400 particles, you are already below 3 angstrom resolution. So, in terms of optics, the, the performance is definitely is definitely there, and uh, we are quite happy, basically, with the, with the setup. Although there are still some things to learn and probably to improve. Okay, so 
In the end, I just wanted to share with you the statistics we accumulated uh, over the last half a year or so on uh, uptime of the microscope. So many people ask, so how, what, what is the amount of your uptime? So I decided to include this information. And what we can see uh, from this pie chart is that uh, in the last seven months, the uptime was uh, nearly 70%, uh, so 60 of which was used for data collection. Uh, about 15% we spent doing breakouts, and uh, there was about 20% downtime. Part of this downtime was actually due to the fact that during this time period we replaced detector from K2 to K3, and uh, the other half mainly was due to minor problems with cry arm, which in many cases were fixed within a uh, short period of time. Okay, so that brings me to conclusions. We can say that the cry arm is suitable microscope for reliable automated data collection uh, of high resolution single particle data set. Uh, in our experience, multiple projects can be handled simultaneously, which is aided by the flexibility of the uh, grid uh, autoloader system. So, yeah, exactly, that has a good flexible system for sample loading. And uh, currently, in combination with K-through detector and serial AM, we have a throughput of around 3,000 images a day, which can be further accelerated. Okay, with this, I would <coughs> like to uh, acknowledge people that contributed to setting up the microscope and the, the facility <coughs> is largely on the shoulders of Markus Fislager, who is a facility manager. Uh, we were helped a lot by Hiratoshi Furusho during the setup phase of the microscope for the software for automated data preprocessing. We set up by Alexander Shkumatov and Laura Strobans prepared um, samples for benchmarking and Adam Schroffel is uh, helping, sorry, he's a new microscopist at the facility, he's helping people with data collection. And uh, we were also uh, very lucky to have extremely good geo engineers, Arnaud Hemskerk and uh, Tsukamori san, who helped tremendously at the initial stages of the facility setup and uh, also provide continuous support for the, for the facility. And of course, all this um, wouldn't be possible without contribution from many, many people uh, involved in building construction, microscope setup, uh, administration, and so on. So I would like to acknowledge their contribution as well. Thank you. <laughs>